Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. It's Terry, your host. I'm coming to you from the flattest state in America. Yeah, I'm in Florida, Lakeland, Florida here at Publix. It's my 90. Um, yeah, Florida's pretty dang flat. Um, not much to look at in terms of terrain. And um, yeah, the traffic here sucks. Like, I've only one time ever driven a semi into the state of Florida. And it's been a minute because that's back when I was with Knight and I drove a load to the Florida East Coast intermodal yard in Jacksonville and then picked up a, a load of tray, dropped that off because it was going to South Florida and then I picked up um, a loaded trailer going to Arkansas. So that's my, that's the extent, that's how deep into Florida I had penetrated up to this point. I used to deliver down here when I had my van, Sprinter van business, but sheesh. I mean, I spent almost every, I, I only have seven minutes left on my 11 hour drive clock. And I thought I would be here in no more than 10 hours but it was like 10 hours and 53 minutes and I was man from Jacksonville Daytona um, into Orlando through Sanford into Orlando out of Orlando out by Disney all the way practically out to Lakeland it was like stop and go or just stop and stop traffic so I think it's gonna be a minute before I come back um, because the loads don't pay great. They're not horrible, but they're not great either. Uh, and it's like 90 degrees right now, and it's only, what, March 3rd? Um, so there's that. So on my way down here, this load I picked up at Chobani in, um, up in New Berlin, New York. On my way down here, though, I went by a road that rang a bell with me in St. Petersburg, or not St. Petersburg, Petersburg, Virginia, and it's called Crater Road. And what Crater Road is, is a road that runs near where the Battle of the Crater took place, and that battle took place on July 30th of 1864. So July, end of July, 1864. What happened was, the Union forces, so there was a siege of Petersburg, Army of the Potomac against Army of Northern Virginia. Um, George Gordon Meade commanding the Army of the Potomac and Robert E. Lee commanding the Army of Northern Virginia. And before you say, oh, well, by that time, Grant was in charge of the Union Army. Well, that's true, but he was the commander of all the Union forces, not just the Army of the Potomac. I've said this before, but when Meade took over just prior to the Gettysburg campaign starting, he never relinquished command of the Army of the Potomac. He kind of played second fiddle to Grant because Grant was um, general in chief of the Union armies. He had taken over for Halleck. But anyway, so that's a little kind of like semantics, but it is important. It is the order of battle. So the Union guys tunnel under the Confederate defenses and they pack it with, you know, like gunpowder, basically, TNT or whatever. And they detonate it and it creates a really big hole and it blasts a hole in the Confederate lines. And to exploit this explosion, they um, they had several regiments ready to just like rush in and get inside the Confederate lines. The problem was that they rushed in basically around and into the crater, but there was no one in the crater. And the Confederates like kind of like got their wits about them and surrounded the top of the crater and just started pouring fire down on him. And Ambrose E. Burnside was actually in the van on this. Like this was his, 
this was his division that was attacking. And, you know, it was a Union defeat. The Union lost a lot of troops. They finally got everybody withdrawn. Um, Burnside was basically, I don't want to say cashiered, but he never commanded a, a unit again. Grant called it the saddest you know, event he had ever witnessed or, you know, words to that effect. Like he was just, you know, appalled. And, uh, <clears throat> and so it, it, what seemed like a good idea and actually worked at first wasn't exploited correctly. And the upshot of this was that the siege of Petersburg ended up going on for like another eight months until well into 1865 trench warfare really it certainly in this you know for u.s forces the first time trench warfare was used and it kind of was a harbinger of what would end up happening in world war one now the interesting thing about world war one is that when the u.s finally did get into world war one in 1917 we really didn't engage in a lot of trench warfare um if you if you're familiar with bella wood and and some of the other battles that we fought especially the marines the marines would just get out of the trenches and go on the offensive so i think there were you know there was some institutional memory from from the petersburg campaign although trenches were you know a thing until at least after you know to the end of world war one so anyway that's what's going on there. Um, so I've been thinking about this hiring freeze at Prime. And sorry about the glare. Um, and, and you know, I was talking with uh, Lyle over at No Hippie Trucking and Transportation the other day. And I said, you know what? I said, maybe they need to come up with some incentive to get more people training. Because there are a lot of people that are certified to train that aren't actually doing it. And hold on one second here. Okay, I'm back. I saw one of the, <laughs> I saw this gal that works here carrying a giant like six by six piece towards the back of my trailer. Apparently, even with the tandem slid back, um, my deck height wasn't high enough, so I had to back up on some ramps. But So getting back to this, shortage or the hiring freeze which is I think been precipitated by the two well two things but really maybe just one primary thing and the first the primary thing is just lack of instructors and as I said a lot of people are qualified but aren't actually using that qualification and then the secondary thing probably is availability of trucks although I don't know if that would slow the training pipeline down if you had enough drivers who are certified to train that were willing to train. And so I was talking with Lyle and I was like, well, what, you know, maybe they need to do something to incentivize people. And he's like, what more incentive do you need than making, you know, X amount of dollars, six, seven, eight thousand bucks a week? you know, when you're doing TNT. Because PSD is a little bit of a different animal. I'm gonna actually find out firsthand um, later this month when I do want a PSD student. But I said, okay, well, that seems like it should be motivation enough, but apparently it's not. And I was thinking about this um, actually towards the end of Paul's um, time on my truck it is when you when you train and you run hard it is a lot of work um, you don't get good sleep you're often awoken even when you're on your 10-hour break like we had a load that canceled in Pennsylvania but I was I was taking the even though I was in the sleeper berth I was taking the calls from sales because they were like, because somebody else had refused the load or something. 
and they're like, oh, can you get there? I'm like, yeah, we're here now. But, you know, they kept waking me up and then my, my fleet manager called me, which is a little unusual. And then I had messages to respond to because, you know, some stuff the trainee can't respond to. And, you know, and it, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a difficult situation sometimes. So I do kind of understand why people don't want to share their spacious apartment. They don't want to, you know, sleep while bouncing around the highways of America. They, you know, maybe it makes them nervous having somebody else driving that they don't really know. Um, there could be, you know, there's personality. Con I mean, that's when it's going well. And then you get into like personality conflicts. You get into people with just not great skills, you know, kind of intangibles like depth perception or night vision or any number of things. So I said, there's got to be something else. And, you know, I was kind of joking with Lyle. I was like, well, maybe they could give him a really nice shirt or something. And he's like, no. So let me run this by you. And, you know, this comes from experience in a different industry. So I used to, even though I was licensed to practice law, I worked for a time at MetLife. Now, MetLife has changed its name. It's no longer MetLife, even though it was for like 100 years. And I was a, I was a commission, I was on commission at MetLife. But one, and MetLife is kind of known as an insurance company because they are, actually, they're a huge insurance company, but they also offer financial services. So I did brokerage, I had a Series 7, I did all sorts of stuff. But one of the things that was always like a selling point of the company for people that stuck around and stayed till retirement was that when, when you sold an insurance policy, you got a commission. And, but the commission was based on the first year of premiums. And you got, you know, there was kind of a sharing like scheme and everything, but essentially you got paid that up front. Then, now if the policy, if somebody canceled the policy after two months, they would recoup that money. However, let's say that the person kept the policy and kept paying on it, paying on it. Eventually, usually after about a year, you would start getting what are called trailing commissions. And trailing commissions happen when somebody makes the premium payment, you get a little tiny bit. But if you stick around for a number of years and you've written hundreds and hundreds of insurance policies, I knew some guys that had trailing commissions that were like 600 bucks a week you know, just for the policy still being enforced. They hadn't, they might not have talked to the people for 10 years, but the policy was, they were still paying the premiums. So this person that sold them the policy still got that trailing commission. And, and guys that stayed with the company till retirement and had a book of business, um, a lot of them were able to keep trailing commissions into retirement. So in, in, it, it depended on how like somebody bought their book of business and they shared the commissions, et cetera. So, what, so I, I said, well, could that work in this environment, in this job? And I, I've mentioned that I think that trainers do have an impact on retention. If somebody has a bad trainer and a bad training experience and then takes that substandard training out into the field and has problems, that's probably not gonna bode well for the retention at a, at a given company because you know, you can't really do anything about the trainer and you know, so what, what do you do? You just get angry and quit and maybe you go to some other company but at least the company that you feel like didn't treat you right is now out of the picture. So anyway, um, what if we said, and, and, and I'm, I'm speaking directly to you, Mr. Lowe, because you're you, that's where the rubber meets the road. So if Mr. Lowe says this is a good idea, it's a done deal, people. But 
What if we said, hey, if you train a person, okay, and this is this is almost this is gonna sound a little bit like multi-level marketing too, by the way. But if you train a person, so let's say I train truck driver one. Once truck driver one has completed their whatever they owe prime, so you know, a year of service, let's say they got their CDL here and everything, and they completed that year of service, right? Because prime needs to get paid back. Then after that, truck driver one, every mile they run, you get a penny of, you get a penny per mile for every mile they run. So if they run 3,000 miles in a month, you get $30 the following month. Now. $30 is not a lot of money. I mean, like now with inflation, it's like a Big Mac meal, you know, 30 bucks, right? I mean, that's if you get the large fries and everything. But can you imagine if you had trained 10 people over your career who all had stayed, right? So now you're getting 300 just using those numbers, 300 a month. And I know most people don't run 3,000 miles, but just round numbers. So now you're getting 300 a month extra. And what if I said that in addition to that, right, here's where the multi-level marketing comes in. If you created a driver who's a solid, solid asset for the company and they end up training, you also get a piece, they get a piece of their trainee after that year, same way, one cent per mile. But you get one cent per mile from the, I guess it'd be the secondary trainee, and then the tertiary trainee, and so on. And you could build up, if people stick with the company, and you know, this grows on itself, you could end up maybe, you know, getting a thousand bucks a month. And here's the other best part of my plan. If, if, and by the way, if somebody in, if somebody in between you and the ultimate driver, in other words, the fifth generation back or the sixth or the eighth, if somebody quits in the middle, you just lose their piece, not the subsequent pieces. So if you were getting through this chain, let's say you were getting seven cents a mile, you and the person that was number four quit, you'd still get six cents a mile, right? because they it would still be connected. But let's say that you're like me and you're pushing 60. And at age 65, although I'm not I'm not going to do this, but it, let's say at age 65 the person's like, "Hey, I'm retiring." It's not really retiring cuz you don't have a pension, but they're leaving the business. They're on good terms with Prime. They're not being fired or anything. They're just hanging up their spurs, right? they would still get a portion of that trailing commission, that trailing mileage commission. Why? Because they did the heavy lifting while they were working for the company to create an environment that fed on itself, right? Because one guy, te you know, so like the guy that taught me to drive, somebody taught him to drive. And somebody taught that guy to drive. And somebody taught that guy to drive. And we could probably trace it back to the invention of the diesel engine. And it really, it is, if you think about it, it, it is a continuum. And just like a good, a good trainer turns out good trainees usually, and I know there are some anomalies, I get that. A bad trainer turns out bad trainees, right? Generally speaking, we want to incentivize good trainers to create good trainees who stick around, and or, or maybe they don't. But it's but the odds are, because I meet a lot of people at this company who are in double digits. I've met people recently. One guy had ten years. 
Uh, another guy had like 22, I think. This guy had 17. People do stick around. Somebody trained those guys. Those guys are a huge asset to the company. Now, I'm not going to quit training if they don't institute my plan. But Mr. Lowe, I'm telling you, this is a way for your hot shit guys and gals to create a stream of income for themselves over the long haul. And it would incentivize the trainers to stay at the company. Instead of some trainer going, okay, now I paid my truck off, I'm gonna go to Landstar or wherever, right? The trainers would also be incentivized just to stick around at the company. Oh, and by the way, in order to establish and maintain eligibility, you would have to do at least one PSD student and one TNT student a year or two TNTs, right? So we'll make it so you still got to, you, you can't just train a bunch of people and then not train for 10 years, right? You got to maintain your qualification and you got to still train periodically, right? You could be a trainer emeritus, but you still got to train. So anyway, I would love to hear comments about this because I know it sounds maybe a little far-fetched, but guess what? If Prime increased the number of trainers it has on the road by just 200 I, who were pretty active, who were training, you know, three, four people a year, I bet you we wouldn't be having a hiring freeze right now because we wouldn't have gotten this backlog like we have. So, comment um, if you got any thoughts. Subscribe, obviously. Oh, by the way, man, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this for later. But anyway, thanks for tuning in. Comment, subscribe, like, share. Um, if you don't like what you're hearing and seeing, subscribe. That's the best way to do something about it. So anyway, talk to you guys later. Be safe. And uh, I think we're going to head north out of here. Unless they got a load going to Cuba. So anyway, talk to you later. Bye.